Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the 2012 Schroeder Lecture. Uh, this lecture is named for Oliver C. Schroeder, Jr. Uh, Ollie joined the faculty of what was then the Western Reserve Law School in 1948, the year I was born. And in 1953, he founded the Law Medicine Center, which was at the time the first law school, well, still is the first law school program in health law in the country, and for many years it was the only one. Um, when Ali retired, a group of, uh, of his uh, friends got together and uh, 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 donated money to endow the Schroeder Scholar in Residence program. And ever since uh, 1986, we have been inviting a distinguished uh, person to come and serve as our Schroeder Scholar in Residence. Um, it's, uh, 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 the Schroeder Scholar uh, spends uh, a, a day or more here with us. Um, uh, has a chance to talk with faculty, students, uh, and but the highlight of the uh, visit is to give the Schroeder lecture, which is, it, which is what we're here for today. Um, the by the terms of the charter of the endowment, the scholar in residence is selected on the basis of scholarly distinction and contribution in the arenas of health policy uh, and health law. Our 2012 Schroeder scholar is Mark Chasson. Mark received his MD from Harvard, a master's in public policy from the Kennedy School of Government, and a master's in public health from UCLA. He's board certified in internal medicine, and he practiced medicine for many years in California and New York. I first met Mark in 1988 when we both served on a committee of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, which was conducting a congressionally a commissioned study of how to assure the quality of care in Medicare. At the time, Mark was, an exec was executive vice president of Value Health Services, which was a health research uh, company in Santa Monica, and he previously had been a health services researcher at the Rand Corporation. Um, is it fair to say we both had a lot more hair back then? Yes. Yeah. Um, Mark's interest in improving the quality of care began as a youngster when he accompanied his father, a surgeon, on rounds at Booth Memorial Hospital in Queens. Mark says that his father doubted that Mark would ever make a living at it, but Mark's energy and passion for quality improvement has led to a long and distinguished career as the commissioner of the New York State Department of Health, as professor of health policy at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, executive vice president for excellence in patient care at the Mount Sinai Medical Center, and since 2008, president of the Joint Commission, the self-regulatory body that accredits U.S. hospitals and healthcare organizations. Mark emphasizes that hospitals must be measured on the basis of their performance, not their reputation. That's why under his leadership, the Joint Commission has made public the results of controversial quality reviews showing which hospitals were the top performers. The second annual report came out in, on September 18th and like the first, listed no hospitals in Cleveland. Uh, so Mark clearly is not afraid of telling it like it is. For example, he points out how a quality measure that requires pneumonia patients to be counseled about smoking cessation can be just a test, as he puts it, of how clever you are in coming up with a discharge planning sheet with smoking cessation information on the back and a checkbox on the front. When physicians and hospital officials sort of laugh a little nervously, as he puts it, Mark tells them, look, I was doing this myself two and a half years ago. I know what's going on out there. We're fortunate then to have Mark here this afternoon to tell us what's going on out there. Uh, the title of his talk is Improving the Quality of Healthcare Where Law, Accreditation, and Professionalism, Professionalism Collide. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Chasson. Thank you, Max, for that uh, very warm introduction and mostly true. Um, I. Um, I want to talk to you about the intersection of law, regulation, uh, accreditation, professionalism uh, around the subject of the quality of health care. And um, maybe at the risk of uh, telling you too much about the quality of health care, uh, more than you wanted to know, um, I'm going to just put it all on the table and we'll stimulate some discussion um, and uh, hopefully there'll be some uh, interest in having that discussion after the talk. Uh, but let me start by uh, just telling you a little bit about what the Joint Commission is, um, because it's uh, probably not a household name. Uh, we are a private, not-for-profit, um, IRS classified 501c3, and our roots actually go back to 1917 when the American College of Surgeons created the first program designed to measure quality in hospitals and go out and look to see whether quality standards were being met. 
Uh, the Joint Commission was created by five organizations to take over that program from the College of Surgeons in 1951, the American Medical Association, the American Hospital Association, College of Surgeons, College of Physicians, and the dentists. And um, the way we work is that hospitals and all the organizations that we accredit or certify uh, pay us to come and look and see whether they're complying with the standards that we create that basically tell them how to provide good quality care. And we have competition in all the fields in which we operate. Um, now, a tiny bit of history. Uh, that program I mentioned, the American College of Surgeons started, uh, created what they called the minimum standard for hospitals in 1919. And there were five requirements. Uh, the hospital ought to have a medical staff. The medical staff should be licensed, competent, and I quote, worthy in character. Those are three different measures of how good <laughs> medical staff is. The medical staff should look at their experience and draw conclusions from it. The hospital should have medical records for all patients. Hospitals didn't have them uniformly back then. And they should have laboratory and x-ray facilities. Now, on October 24, 1919, uh, college officials held the first announcement of the first results of the trials of applying these standards in a conference in New York City. Um, at the Waldorf Astoria, actually. And the night before the conference, before they released the results, uh, they were a little nervous because only 13% of the nearly 700 hospitals that they surveyed passed the minimum standard. So they uh, took the documents that listed the names of the hospitals and they went down to the basement of the Waldorf Astoria and put those documents in the furnace and burned them up so they were not able to release them to the media. That's a true story, actually. Uh, so flat, uh, fast forward to 2012, the middle of this year, uh, we accredit now about 20,000 healthcare organizations in the United States and almost 600 uh, in 52 countries around the world. And you can see from this uh, little table that we accredit lots and lots of different kinds of healthcare organizations. Almost any healthcare organization that provides health services uh, we have a presence in this field in, as, and as I said, we have competitors in all of them. Uh, what do we actually do, though? Um, well, we create and continuously update requirements for all of these healthcare organizations in their very different fields that tell them how safe and high quality care should be provided in those different settings. And then, in a parallel way, which is equally important, we are constantly developing and changing, improving, and then deploying in the field ways to send individuals out, we call them surveyors or reviewers, to all of these different kinds of organizations, whether they're home care organizations or behavioral health organizations or hospitals, and figuring out how to visit for a very short time, actually, um, varies depending on the size of the organization, but. Uh, usually a medium-sized community hospital would have three folks there for four or five days. Uh, and during that visit, we are charged with assessing whether the hospital is complying with all of the standards that are in our manuals. And that's a very challenging part of the business that we're in, and we're constantly working on improving it. It's a part of the activity that is uh, not as well understood as some of the other things that we do. We also create and maintain uh, the single most effective system for measuring quality in hospitals, and that's only been around for about a decade. And finally, we also are an improvement organization. We develop and disseminate interventions that our customers can use, and non-customers, since we're a not-for-profit, uh, to directly improve quality of care and get rid of hospital-associated infections and other quality problems. So. Uh, that's in, in a very uh, brief overview, uh, the critical functions that we, uh, that we perform. Now, when we get done with that and we say a hospital has passed this test, this accreditation test, um, what does that mean? Well, let me first say what it's not. What it means is it's, they passed the test. We've set out the standards, we've gone and looked, and we've said, you are in compliance with these standards at the time we went out there. Now, accreditation is not 
a guarantee that no errors will occur. Um, it's not a guarantee that preventable com complications will never harm patients. Um, sorry about the double negatives there. And it's not a guarantee that high quality of care will always be delivered to every patient. It is no more or less than an attestation that we've gone through our process, we've looked at the practices in these organizations, and they've passed the test. Now, typically, we'll find places where the organization is not in compliance, and we point those out, and they change their the way they're doing that particular part of the care that they provide. They provide us evidence that they have complied and they keep their accreditation. So it's a, an ongoing process and a back and forth one. Uh, but accreditation can't solve all of our quality problems. And we have a lot of quality problems. Um, and if you uh, read newspapers, look at the internet, you see them almost every day. Uh, here's a hospital, Tulane, in uh, Louisiana that had to notify 360 patients because their gastrointestinal endoscopes, the tubes that allow us to look in the stomach and in the colon, uh, they had failed to properly sterilize them, clean them and de decontaminate them, exposing patients to hepatitis B and C and HIV uh, in possible infection. And here's a hospital in, uh, near Pittsburgh that had to notify 141 patients that they had stents, those little springs that are put in coronary arteries to expand uh, obstruction and keep them open. They had stents put in unnecessarily. Here's a patient a couple years ago who uh, went into a hospital in Minnesota with a cancer in one kidney, but they took the healthy kidney out instead of taking the kidney with the cancer out. And this is an almost identical event in the UK. Only in this instance, a medical student in the operating theater told the surgeon he was operating on the wrong kidney. But the operation continued, the diseased kidney was left in, and the patient died about five weeks later. And we set fire to patients in our operating rooms four or five hundred times a year. So maybe that's more than you wanted to know about <laughs> the quality of health care. Uh, we have been intensely, the whole industry and indeed globally, has been focused on improving quality of care in a way that is unprecedented for the last 10 or 12 years. So it is not for lack of effort that we still have these quality problems, but it is fair to say today, even despite that effort, that we are faced with a situation in which routine safety processes fail rather routinely. So whether it is our inability to get caregivers to wash their hands every time they are supposed to, uh, whether it's our inability to get rid of serious medication errors that harm patients or uh, these other problems, or to prevent these uncommon but completely preventable adverse events. We have a long way to go before we can assure that quality is what we all want it to be in healthcare. Now, as that uh, headline I showed you from the UK points out, uh, or leads me to point out, uh, all of these quality problems are indeed global. And if you look around the world, and I mentioned we have, uh, the, uh, I, we have a very large, in fact, the largest international accrediting program uh, in the world, there is great diversity among developed countries in how healthcare is organized, how it's financed, how it's delivered, how it's structured, the balance between public and private sector activities in healthcare, and it doesn't matter. All developed healthcare systems struggle with exactly the same quality problems that I've given you a little bit of a flavor of that we struggle with in the United States. No system has figured out how to solve these critical problems. And in fact, the failures in all of them are very common. So if this is a condition of healthcare in the 21st century, but we aspire to much higher quality, we have to look outside of healthcare for models. 
and I will talk uh, more about that in a moment. So if we put this quality set of problems into the context of all of the oversight that exists, there's obviously public law and regulation, uh, the federal alphabet soup, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Health Resources and Services Administration, and th those are just the ones I could fit in 32 point font on one line. There are many others. Uh, states have a critical role, in fact. They license professionals, they license individuals who practice medicine and other health professions. They're responsible uh, for virtually all of the public health protection that populations uh, require uh, to get good quality care from a population perspective. Private organizations like the Joint Commission, accrediting bodies in many fields, and other uh, organizations in the private sector devoted to improving and maintaining quality are all over the place. And then there are the delivery system efforts, whether it's inside organizations like the Cleveland Clinic or the Mayo Clinic or Geising or others like Kaiser that have pioneered quality improvement activities, those are also uh, manifold. And then there's our system of medical malpractice that is supposed to have an influence on quality of care. So it's not for lack of trying that we still have quality problems. So how do all of these come together and what are their proper roles? Well, um, I've indicated some of the quality failures that we see. Oversight failures also happen uh, with extraordinary frequency. Uh, we are in the midst of this uh, fungal meningitis outbreak, uh, which has doubled in just the last 10 days in scope. And every single one of the oversight functions that I've mentioned on the previous slide, and I I'm not, didn't try to be comprehensive, but just to give you a, a, a sketch of all of the different jurisdictions and types of oversight, um, law, regulation, and private oversight that exist, all of them have flaws. None of them are perfect. So I said, I think we need to look outside of healthcare. So let's start to do that. There are other models. Uh, there's occupational safety and health. And if you look, for example, within that uh, domain at mine safety, there's a mine safety and health administration uh, that has had notable failures in the United States in coal mining, for example. You remember the coal mining disasters? But let me tell you a different story from mining, the story of Alcoa. Alcoa company has, it's a global company that has mines all around the world in addition to the US. And it was one of the worst, had one of the worst safety records some years ago uh, when a new CEO came into office, Paul O'Neill his name was, he later became the Secretary of the Treasury. And he pioneered a complete turnaround at Alcoa. The laws didn't change, the technology didn't change. What changed? Well, he brought a story of a man who was killed in a mine accident, in one of Alcoa's mines, to a board meeting. And he told the story at the board meeting, and he looked around at the board members, all of whom were men, and he said, gentlemen, we killed this man. And that's what started the turnaround at Alcoa. The governing body of the organization taking responsibility for worker safety. And from that moment, a whole series of initiatives carried through from the board to the management that communicated to everyone across the globe in Alcoa that worker safety was not just priority number 25 out of 50. It was number one, the number one priority. And they put a whole raft of innovations into place, including instant communication of the smallest workplace accident to everybody in the organization so that every like part of Alcoa would know that this was a risk. The look back after an accident to find out why it happened, look for those flaws and fix them and communicate that across the company around the world so that every part of the organization would benefit from the learning that occurred at one place that it had an accident. And I, 
I could go on, but I, but I won't. So that's an example in a field where worker safety is hugely variable to this day of an organization that created the best mine safety record in the world. There's food safety, there's water quality, there's airline safety, and there's nuclear power. So if we are a little more systematic than that one story about looking outside healthcare for what the right interplay of law, regulation, federal, state, private, internal organizational activities are, let's pick some industries, some organizations that have really gotten it right. And in fact, there is a research literature on these organizations. They're called high reliability organizations because they deal with hazard that is every bit as dangerous and difficult as we do in healthcare, but they do it a lot better. In fact, they have adverse event rates that are 1,000, even 10,000 fold lower than in healthcare. And some of the usual suspects that you, one usually hears about in this discussion are uh, air travel, nuclear power, but there are a number of other organizations that have been studied by these uh, scholars and these actual practical improvers, and they're pretty far afield. So places like amusement parks have a lot of characteristics that are very similar to the way airlines and nuclear power stay safe. Wildland firefighting crews, aircraft carrier flight decks. If you ever want a little bit of a scary experience, uh, Google the uh, aircraft uh, carrier series called Carrier, it was on PBS about 10 years ago, and look for the pitching deck episode. And this is where they practice landing on an aircraft carrier in high seas at night. When the fighter jets are coming in to land on an aircraft carrier deck, which is pitching up and down, so that in the instant before the jet fighter lands, it looks to the pilot like he's gonna crash right into the underside of the deck, but then it flattens out and he lands. They have a vanishingly small adverse event rate. Why is that? What do all of these organizations have in common? Well, to simplify just a little bit, in addition to a passionate devotion to safety like I described Paul O'Neill had, they have incredibly effective tools to improve the processes that they have to complete in order to be safe. They also have a safety culture that wraps around those nearly perfect processes and keeps them working at very high levels of performance over long periods of time. That safety culture is critically driven mostly by the expectations of the workers on the front line. And I'll talk more about that because that really distinguishes uh, these organizations uh, the most from healthcare. The way they stay safe is very interesting. You know, in healthcare, uh, we are most often in the situation of experiencing, whether we're a hospital or an ambulatory surgery center or a nursing home, experiencing an event in which a patient was harmed and then we do something the Joint Commission introduced like 15 years ago, 20 years ago, called a root cause analysis, figure out why that harm event happened so that we can start teaching folks how to correct the problem so it doesn't happen again. That's not how these organizations stay safe. The way they stay safe is that everybody on that aircraft carrier deck, for example, is always looking for the smallest thing that might go wrong. One of them, for example, is a foreign object on the deck something as simple as a screwdriver. If it's left on the deck and one of these jet jets is landing, it gets sucked into the jet engine and blows it up. They look for the smallest thing that's wrong so that it can be identified before it poses risk, way upstream from harm when it's actually much easier to fix than after it's been allowed to grow and mushroom into a very risky problem. They fix those things right away using those very highly effective tools and that leads to more reports of small things further upstream from harm. That's how these organizations stay safe. We are nowhere near that capacity or that situation in healthcare. So if I was to describe this uh, thing called a safety culture, which I've said is uh, so important to um, making a really safe organization, 
Uh, this borrows from uh, the work of James Reason, who I'll talk uh, more about in a moment. And he said that if you look inside these organizations, there are three imperatives that link all of this together. Trust, report, and improve. And each of them is linked to the other. So in order to find the small things that are wrong, every worker needs to trust his or her peers. Because finding something that's wrong usually means uncovering mistakes that were made. Finding a safety procedure that isn't constructed quite right, so you have to take a shortcut and violate the protocol in order, in order to get the work done. That's an unsafe condition. But it me revealing it means that somebody is going to have the opportunity to blame the people that did the shortcut. But that's okay in a high reliability organization because you want to identify those unsafe conditions. Once you identify them, the worker also has to have trust in management. That management will take that report seriously and fix the problem and communicate that improvement back so that the worker's trust and initial trust in, uh, in delivering the report is justified. That reinforces trust. You get more reports further upstream from harm and it turns into a very positively reinforcing culture that keeps these organizations safe. Now, um, I'll tell you uh, another story. Um, I think we have time. Um, in talking about this all around the world, I uh, frequently tell a story about an aircraft carrier flight deck and give the example of a worker losing a tool and reporting it. Um, as an example of how this works in other industries. And then uh, in a room filled with uh, healthcare professionals, I'll, uh, tip, uh, typically in hospitals, I'll say, um, think about the place in your hospital where medical instruments for surgery are cleaned and decontaminated and sterilized in preparation for the next group of surgical procedures. And think about the busiest time of the Usually mid-morning after the first round of surgical cases has been completed, the instruments are coming back, they're being reprocessed. And think about a surgical tech, a, a, a sterile processing tech who was just hired about three or four months ago. He's on the job and he sees a problem with one part of the cleaning and decontamination process. How many of you are certain in your hospital that that technician would do the right thing and tell his supervisor right away that there's a problem with this part of the decontamination process, question one. Question two, how many of you are certain that supervisor would do the right thing and stop all of the sterilization process, retrieve all those instruments that were improperly cleaned and decontaminated until the problem was corrected? So at the risk of telling you a little more, about quality that you don't want to know. I've asked this question all around the world, um, whether it's in Europe, the Middle East, Asia Pacific, all around the country. And what would you guess is the percentage of hands that go up in answer to the questions, are you certain? 5%. One in 20. And then um, I say, that's the gap between that 5% and the 100% that you would get at a meeting of aircraft carrier flight deck engineers or amusement park engineers or anybody in the high reliability industry and in nuclear power and commercial aviation, that's the gap that healthcare has to traverse in order to get to be highly reliable. Now, let me also uh, show you the positive side of this. Um, I said airlines were really safe. Uh, well, uh, in the decade of the 90s, uh, there were an average U.S. air carriers now, not Air Bulgaria. We're not talking about that <laughs> part of the industry. 129 deaths per year on average and 9.3 million flights per year. That's a rate of 13.9 deaths per million flights. And in the 90s, the U.S. airline industry was the safest in the world. Another characteristic of high reliability industries is that they keep pushing the envelope further on safety just the next decade. The deaths were reduced to 18 per year, 10.6 million flights per year. That's a rate of 1.74 deaths per million flights. 
Moving from 13.9 to 1.74 is a drop of 87% in the death rate in US airlines. That's unbelievable in an industry that was already the safest on the planet. But that's another characteristic of high reliability industries. Now, uh, how did air travel get that safe? It's a fascinating series of stories. First of all, progressively safer equipment. And that uh, was true from the 40s through the 70s. But then when NASA looked at a whole series of air crashes in the 70s, they found some, that the landscape had completely changed, that 80% of those crashes had nothing to do with equipment failure. They all had to do with failures of communication in the cockpit, only three people there, sometimes two, about problems. And those failures involved things like the junior co-pilot would say, uh, I think there's a funny thing going on with this gauge. And the captain would say, shut up and do your job. So long story short, that led, that finding led immediately to a radical change in the industry. They developed and deployed something called crew resource management training throughout the 80s. And it is now standard in the industry. Every uh, cockpit crew goes through it every year to eliminate the hierarchy in the cockpit to set the expectation for clear communication about concerns, to facilitate the immediate identification and communication and resolution of anybody's concern about an unsafe condition. That is what's led to the dramatic improvement in the last 20 years in the safety of air travel. So uh, in a famous uh, IOM report, uh, to compare this to healthcare, um, this was the estimate of the number of deaths in hospitals due to errors. Uh, there are 34 million hospitalizations a year, so that's a rate of 1,300 to 2,800 deaths due to error uh, per million hospitalizations on the airline is 1.74. So by this measure, hospital care is between 750 and 1,600 times less safe than air travel. Uh, you don't like that measure? Here's another one. Um, and I'll get back to this study at the end because it uh, has a has bearing on malpractice. The best study of errors and harm in hospital care, it's old, but it showed about 1% of hospital patients were injured, injury in addition to uh, death due to negligent errors. That's a rate of 10,000 per million. The equivalent for US airlines, death plus serious injury, 341 people per year, 95 million flights, that's a rate of 3.6. 10,000 compared to 3.6. On this metric, hospital care is almost 3,000 times less safe than air travel. So there is a legal framework. There's law and regulation in air travel, just like there is in healthcare, obviously different. But Law and regulation have important limitations. And importantly, especially in healthcare, but in other fields where, sci where the science and the technology evolves, uh, law and regulation just can't keep up with the state of the art in science and in healthcare practice. The adversarial nature of enforcing law works against improvement. You hide stuff when the cops are around. And in the bad old days when the Joint Commission had the atmosphere around it of being inspectors and cops, um, it was not uncommon, for instance, in a busy hospital, one of the things we look for is uh, are the hallways crowded so that a fire uh, response would be impeded? And one of the standard techniques in hospitals in those days was to hire giant moving vans move all of the equipment that wasn't being used, that was cluttering up the hallways, into the moving vans because they knew when we were coming. The moving vans would circle the city until we were gone and then would come back and put the clutter right back in the hallways. Now we've gotten better at, um, all of our surveys are unannounced, for example, uh, and we've gotten much better at driving home improvement messages as opposed to the steel ruler across the knuckles punishing people. But the point is that law enforcement works against improvement. 
It also has unintended consequences, and I'll give you a couple of illustrations of that. And fundamentally, when we're talking about the critical importance of culture, law can't change culture. It's not possible. So um, this was a, a really interesting uh, article by George Annis a couple of months ago. Uh, the, New, the New England Journal of Medicine is having a series of uh, 200th anniversary uh, articles, and George is a very well-known uh, health lawyer, particularly in ethics. And this, uh, he led this article off by saying, medical care in 2012 is unrecognizable as compared with what it was in 1812. It's the 200th anniversary of the New England Journal. And no 19th century physician would be at home in a modern hospital. A 19th century lawyer, however, would be completely at home in a contemporary courtroom as would a present day lawyer transported back to the early 19th century. Now, I don't know if you agree with uh, George on this point. The only reason for me bringing it up is to, uh, that I think it is evidence that law changes more slowly than healthcare. And just to illustrate this uh, with a specific healthcare example, the Medicare program, which is one of the uh, federal uh, structures of law and regulation that healthcare deals with, has things called the conditions of participation, which are rules that providers have to meet in order to qualify for payment. It's in they are enacted in federal regulation, which means they are hard to change. And many are aimed directly at improving quality, at guaranteeing that you have to provide this level of quality in order to qualify for Medicare payment. In 1965, when the Medicare program was created, these conditions were adopted, the first version of them, were the Joint Commission accreditation standards of 1965. Now we change, improve, I mentioned at the very beginning, modernize our standards every year to keep up with changing science and practice. Um, in fact, our customers uh, think we change things too often and make it more difficult for them, so that's a balance that we have to strike. Um, the next time the conditions of participation in the Medicare regulations were, uh, were modernized was 1986. That is the only time they've been modernized as a whole since 1965. So as an example of a practice that is commonplace today that Medicare ruled a few years ago was uh, a violation, um, are orders that are adopted by the medical staff of a hospital to authorize nurses to give medications under certain circumstances. A newborn in the nursery at three o'clock in the morning needs antibiotic ointment in his or her eyes. Medicare said because the doctor didn't sign that order specifically for that patient, that's a violation of the conditions of participation. We have, which is absurd, and uh, it was through a huge amount of effort that we actually got Medicare to change that view, but the rigidity of the regulation, they felt made it uh, mandatory on them to call that a violation. Telehealth. Uh, the ability of a remote hospital to send an image of a CT scan in a patient with head trauma to a, a tertiary care facility and have a neuroradiologist read that result and give important information back to that remote hospital didn't exist in 1986 or 1965. So Medicare said you can't do that until, again, we brought this problem uh, to a much closer attention. They changed that regulation. The rigidity of law and regulation uh, in trying to deal with quality and safety problems is just an insurmountable obstacle. And then there are unintended consequences when you do things badly. So the Affordable Care Act has penalties for hospitals with uh, rates of readmissions that are too high, rates of complications that are high. Uh, and that resulted from uh, some research that showed that a lot of Medicare patients, when they go home from a hospitalization, are admitted to the hospital again within 30 days. And a whole brouhaha of that's waste and it's inefficient and hospitals are really bad. Well, it turns out that that measure is a very bad measure of quality. And now hospitals are penalized if their readmission rate within 30 days is high. So let me ask you, is a readmission at 31 days better quality than at 29 days? And if you have a financial incentive 
to avoid the 29-day readmission and make it a 31-day readmission, maybe you'll just keep the patient at home or in an observation unit or in an ambulatory area while they're getting worse. You have an incentive to do that. Do folks do that? We don't know. But this is a really bad measure of quality, and it encourages this kind of manipulation. Measures of complications that Medicare uh, providers are also penalized for are based on calculations that come from data in hospital bills, not from looking at the clinical course of a patient and making a judgment that's a clinical judgment, but whether something is listed as a diagnosis on a bill. Turns out it's a lot easier to manipulate the way you code some of those diagnoses than to do the hard work of improving care. So just a few examples of rigidity, unintended consequences. We can't rely on law and regulation, especially in healthcare, to do anything good for us, and certainly not to get us to the level of quality that I've been uh, talking about in high reliability organizations. Well, I've saved the best for last. Um, what a, what's the role of the way we handle medical malpractice? Well, what is it supposed to do? Um, it's supposed to deter negligent behavior, right? Uh, if you know you're going to get sued, you won't engage in negligent behavior. Um, it's supposed to encourage quality improvement in order to reduce the likelihood of negligent behavior, and it's supposed to compensate victims, right? Um, one person's opinion, backed by some data, my opinion, doesn't do any of these aims very well, and it can't be fixed. Primarily because that theory, the theory on which we approach medical malpractice, is completely discredited. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Medical malpractice, the way we deal with it in the US, is based on the way I was taught patients are harmed when I was in medical school by errors. It's very simple. You make a mistake and a patient gets hurt. Really simple. The worse the mistake, if it exceeds the barrier of standard of care, it's negligent, you're at fault. Well, the problem is that while this does exist as a pathway for leading to the kinds of adverse events that we've been talking about, it turns out to be very rare. Now, do we have people that do egregious things? Yes, we do. Um, here's Charles Cullen, a nurse who was suspected to have killed as many as 300 patients over a 16-year career in 10 hospitals in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, uh, who was sentenced a few years ago to 397 years, 11 consecutive life terms. Now, okay, this is a bunch of lawyers. This is criminal behavior. We're not talking about criminal. We're talking about civil. But it's exactly the same finding. If you look behind an adverse event, that would be the subject of a malpractice case, what you find is not one mistake, not one individual who makes mistakes, but lots of people making lots of mistakes, 15, 20, 30, 40, depending on how closely you look. And most of the mistakes are really tiny, which I'll show you an example of in a second. It is impossible if you look carefully at these events to say this is the one that caused the adverse event. This is the one that caused the harm. They all had to happen in order for the harm to result. And there were lots of opportunities for individuals as the events unfolded, if they had had more of a safety culture outlook, to realize something was going wrong here and stop the sequence before harm resulted. So that sort of retrospective, um, the way this plays out in prospect, in the real world, is always with the same first event. All of these adverse events start with the same first step. Somebody makes the first mistake. That mistake challenges defenses that we've created in our organization in our hospitals, stick with hospitals, to prevent the error from doing harm. But all those defenses have weaknesses. And if that first mistake gets past a defense, it challenges the next one, and the next error challenges the next one, and harm occurs only after a series of errors has penetrated all of the defenses 
that are in front of that patient. Uh, Jim Reason, who is a genius in my view, uh, this is Jim, and this is the place where you can look uh, for an explication of his Swiss cheese model. He has described this situation in complex organizations, whether it is the nuclear power plant at Chernobyl, the chemical plant at Bhopal, the Challenger accidents, they all have this characteristic pattern. Now, what do I mean by defenses? Well, in healthcare, these are some of the defenses that we have. We hire the right people, the leadership makes sure we've got the right structure in place. I'm not gonna read all of these things, but all of these have weaknesses. So if you think about these defenses as slices of Swiss cheese, there are holes in them called latent conditions that don't do any harm until somebody makes the first mistake, which is like throwing a dart at that first slice of Swiss cheese from behind, right? If it hits the cheese part, then we're okay. But if it goes through a hole, a weakness, that it's permitted to go through because that weakness wasn't identified and corrected, it challenges the next defense, the next slice of Swiss cheese. Harm results only with a series of errors that get through every single defense. Let me give you an example uh, from outside of healthcare. Uh, there was a, uh, a ferry called the Herald of Free Enterprise in 1987 that took off, that uh, left the dock at Zeebrugge in Belgium, headed for Dover in England, crossing the English Channel. About 20 minutes after leaving port, it began to take on water over the bow, and it sank in about two minutes, killing 193 people. What happened? So this is a ferry that's roll on, roll off, cars and people. And in order to get cars on, you've got to open the doors in the front of the boat. Somebody forgot to close the doors, the front of the boat. That's how 200, nearly 200 people died. A, one hole in a Swiss, in one of the slices, in one of the defenses in this boat was that the company rules said that the captain makes the decision about leaving port based on negative reporting. What that means is he assumed that all the safety procedures were followed unless one of the crew called him and said, we got a problem, don't leave. Latent condition. Hole in the defense there, they had left port many, many times, no problem. Another hole in another defense, there was no electronic indicator on the bridge that the captain could look at to say the doors are closed. That's just two of them. What was the error? The bosun's mate who was assigned to close the doors had come off a night maintenance shift and was asleep and didn't get up to close the doors. It took that error to expose all the latent conditions and there were more, it's a longer story than that but you get the idea. So here's a, a real healthcare case uh, that I'll uh, shorten for you that makes the point, I think, even more pertinently. This uh, is one uh, case I'm very familiar with from a previous life. Uh, this happened to an 80-year-old uh, woman who had a lot of problems and was admitted to the hospital from the emergency department with one of her orders was for phenytoin, Dilantin is the brand name of this drug, 300 milligrams three times a day. Now that's a huge dose, should be about 100 milligrams uh, a day for, that's a huge dose for a, uh, a younger person. This is an enormous dose for an older person. But this hospital had a defense. It had an EDR, an electronic data repository that had information about all its patients' drugs. And the resident, the trainee, who was on duty that night consulted the electronic data repository and that was the order, 300 milligrams three times a day. Now, a weakness in the EDR defense is that not all the data were right. Weakness in the resident's uh, knowledge base is he didn't recognize that that was potentially a huge dose. Another defense this hospital had was, despite having computer order entry where computer, uh, computers took all the orders for drugs, a real live pharmacist looked at every new order for every patient and caught the error. He communicated that error. 
to the nurse and the doctor covering for that patient. Now it's about midnight on the night she was admitted. But a failure in the communication defense, there was no communication of that problem from the night shift to the day shift. So the nurse who came on in the morning saw the order for three times a day medication and there were no dispensed medication. Now this hospital had another defense called unit dosing. Pills were wrapped and named and labeled for individual patients. So there were none of those labeled for that patient. Why? Because the pharmacist said, this is a mistake. Let's resolve and make sure that we know what we're doing in the morning. But the nurse confronted this situation, went to see her patient, who was a little confused because that's what happens to old people in unfamiliar surroundings. The nurse thought that she might not be able to swallow these very large pills that uh, phenytoin capsules that phenytoin comes in. And what do you think she did? She actually borrowed another patient's phenytoin, which was dispensed as a liquid, as a suspension. A hole in the unit dose defense for the hospital was that suspension wasn't dispensed in unit doses. It was dispensed in small bottles. So she was able to do that. And this went on for several days. The patient became severely toxic until finally the story was unraveled and she had a, a, a good outcome. But I illustrate this, and there were lots more, uh, lots more events here. I illustrate this to show you the combination that has to occur in these adverse events between small mistakes that people make, you know, I didn't know, the resident didn't know that the dilantin was, sh that was a big dose. Uh, there was a miscommunication between the night shift and the day shift, happens all the time. Where's the negligence here? Where's the smoking gun? Where's the single error that caused this? And this is typical when we look at these adverse events. So the malpractice approach of blaming a single individual for making a single critical mistake uh, is almost never consistent with reality. That is the reality of how patients are harmed. Now, in the study that I mentioned, I'm going to close in about a minute, the study that I mentioned uh, that looked at negligent adverse events was a very large study, first done in New York and then repeated in Colorado, uh, found this high rate of patients injured by negligence. And they also did this study not just to look at the kind of injuries that occurred in, in, in this situation, but they also asked the question, what's the relationship between actual patients injured by errors that are severe enough to be called negligent in the legal definition and malpractice? So the first thing they did was to say, here's a whole bunch of patients injured by negligence how many filed malpractice claims? What do you think the answer to this question is? Anybody want to hazard a number? 5%. Close, 2%. <coughs> so there's very few patients who are actually injured who file malpractice claims. Now, what about the other side? So there's this group of patients injured by negligence, and here are a whole bunch of people who are filing malpractice claims. The overlap is very, very little, but what's the relative height of the piles, if you will? So what's the ratio of negligent adverse events to malpractice lawsuits? Are there more, more lawsuits or more patients injured by negligence? More patients injured by errors, 7.6 patients injured by error compared to one lawsuit. So um, malpractice doesn't work. It doesn't improve quality. It doesn't compensate victims. It doesn't deter bad behavior. And it's based on a theory that does not explain how patients are injured in healthcare settings. Law and regulation can assure quality. Malpractice is almost, I would argue, entirely unrelated to quality of care. I don't know what good it does. You can tell me that. Accreditation and professionalism and other private efforts are necessary but by themselves are not sufficient. The culture of a regulated industry is the most critical determinant, determinant of the quality and safety in that industry. The second most important is the capacity for implementing improvement and both of those are sorely lacking in healthcare. So we need law and regulation as a general framework um, but they do not remotely accomplish the task. Licensing of physicians hasn't changed in almost 200 years. 
If I'm licensed as a physician, I, from the standpoint of the state, I can perform neurosurgery, deliver babies. Um, that hasn't changed much. To achieve high reliability, we need public pressure for better results because they are achievable. But as long as we continue to tolerate mediocrity, that's what we'll get. We need more aggressive efforts on the private sector, including from organizations like mine. And we need to get rid of the behaviors and practices that undermine a culture of safety, the kind of intimidating behavior that suppresses the reports from pharmacists and nurses about potentially lethal drug orders. And professionalism has to expand in healthcare to incorporate the goal of high reliability. One of the biggest obstacles to getting this ball rolling is the belief in healthcare that zero, like what we almost have in airline safety, is not possible in healthcare. Well, we have examples of where it is possible. And we need a combination of what I've been talking about if we're going to make real and substantial progress. Thank you very much. We have time maybe for a couple of minutes of questions. Um, if this is being webcast, so if you have a question or a comment, please come up to one of the microphones. I'll let you call over. Sir, you mentioned, please. Uh, you mentioned the culture and how important that is. Yes. And I'd just like to give you, um, a, you have models from other industries, and I have a brief and rather silly example from another industry. Uh, when I was in law school and college, I worked for a very large fast food chain. I won't mention the name, but I'll tell you their spokesman is a clown <laughs> named, named Ronald. Um, in the beginning when that organization started, they had a great deal of trouble with the franchisees, which would be equivalent to your member hospitals. It was impossible to keep up the standards of what they called quality, service, and cleanliness. So they decided they would have to go from a hope for altruism to instilling fear. And that was done through any customer who came in could be a company employee, a spy, an undercover person. When you were waiting on somebody, you never knew if it was a spy or a real customer. And the other approach they took was the one that you say you've gone to, which is inspections are random, unannounced, and then people are held accountable. So is that something you've considered? Uh, there are elements of uh, those solutions that can work in healthcare. Um, the problem with um, making that a uniform approach is that um, making hamburgers is a lot simpler than the delivery of the complexity of healthcare that takes place in even a medium sized community hospital. You couldn't possibly look at all of the aspects of that organization. So we have to deal just like the other high reliability industries. So uh, we have to deal with a much more fluid and much more complex uh, set of circumstances. But we, we learn from those experiences too. So now, as I said, all of our surveys are unannounced. And um, we've taken away the paper review process. So we have now our surveyors are out in the care delivery settings interviewing patients, interviewing families and staff and assimilating that information into the judgments about whether the hospital or other organization is in compliance. Hi, Dr. Tassin. Hi. Um, quick question about your, um, what you mentioned about uh, the airlines reducing uh, deaths and whatnot. In your work, have you seen, um, or, or could you kind of talk about anything that might be different in the medical field um, in terms of culture that uh, between a nuclear engineer, uh, airline pilot, that you know, gives us this huge gap um, and just kind of your ideas. Yeah, right? yeah they're, they're, it's a good question uh, because there are a lot of differences and there's a lot of, res well, a lot of, there's a fair amount of resistance in healthcare to using these examples uh, because physicians will say patients are not airplanes. Uh, every 747 is the same, every patient is different. And there is truth to the differences between healthcare and these other uh, situations, but there's also a lot of commonality. So there, it is uh, much more true that we can standardize our approach in healthcare 
to the routine conditions, procedures, and treatments that we have to deliver than it is that we have to individualize every single one. And we've seen enormous progress in quality and safety by standardizing routines. So it makes it easy for healthcare teams to do the routine thing perfectly every time and devote most of their, the art of their, uh, of their professions to looking for the things that are different that need to be handled differently. So it's not a one-for-one -one translation. So you can't take um, a mechanism like a checklist, for example, we have a lot of publicity about checklists, and slap it into a healthcare organization. A checklist by itself won't change behavior. You have to change the process first, and then a checklist is a good way to make sure that all the things that we know we're supposed to be doing, and we do almost all the time, are literally being done 100% of the time. But by itself, that intervention doesn't change a process. Okay, we should stop now because it is five, after 5.30. Um, Dr. Chasson will stay with us, I think, for a while. Indeed. There's some refreshments outside. Please join us outside for refreshments and thank uh, Dr. Chasson once again. I'm told. Um, I don't know what it is. I think it's a mug, but I can ship that if you'd like. If you have room. All right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we'll talk more at dinner because dinner is an.